to everyone who has logged in and is online. Thank you for participating and welcome to this 30 minute session on autonomous vessels, a concept in the making. I am Anne-Marie Triste, product director of Next Generation Shipping in Kongsberg, and I have the pleasure of talking to you guys today, hopefully managing to bring some clarity and insight to the subject of autonomous vessels. Before we start, I would just like to say that I will open for a Q&A session at the end, and please use the Q&A function rather than the chat option on the menu bar. Also, after the second webinar session next week, a recording will be sent to all of you. Um, and I would encourage you who are online today to answer a short survey after this webinar. So thank you for that. And then I would like to start with the number one key point I want you to remember. Autonomous does not equal unmanned. And in about five minutes, you will understand why. But first, a quick reflection on the Marine 4.0. The maritime industry has seen great technological shifts over the years and is once again in the middle of a profound change. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit us like a ton of bricks, the maritime industry was in the era of digitalization, data, Connectivity and optimization were becoming a key factors and not just hyped buzzwords. And with the recent situation, this focus is strengthened also in our daily life, just like this webinar, for example, we are in together right now. We are experiencing a shift from standalone products to integrated systems and beyond to consumer oriented on demand services. The goals are safer, more efficient, and more sustainable maritime operations, where data and connectivity are key enablers. As Dr. Martin Stopford of Clarkson Plateau Research once put it, digitalization is really about empowering people to make good decisions. Digital awareness is an integrated into daily operation and asset management and enables us to connect systems together. And this is forming the basis for a remote monitoring, supervision, intervention, or even autonomous operation. Another focus area strongly contributing to new and innovative solutions and technological advancements is the focus on environmental impact from the maritime industry. Sustainability has become a matter of course. Globalization has made size and global footprint for suppliers to a key qualification. And the focus is directed more than ever on the entire logistical chain where the vessel is an integral part of a larger picture. And now we arrive at the second key point. Autonomy is not a goal in itself. Remember that. So what is the motivation for autonomy? Autonomy is a means to another larger goal, such as increased safety for human lives, reduced emissions by reducing vessel speed, optimizing system performance, moving more goods from the road to sea, or enabling a more dynamic work-life balance for families by placing the operator on land, at least a part of the time. We are looking into how to increase the value for the customer, ensuring high degree of consistency and safety, while at the same time reducing the OPEX of the vessel. Other factors supporting the development of autonomous vessels are, for example, human limitations like fatigue, and manning competency, like access to experts in the loop who are awake and sharp, and insurance. And that's a, an interesting topic in itself. But first, let us take a look at the difference between an automated system and an autonomous system. An automated system is characterized by having well-defined functions with pre-programmed link between sensor input and system output, and operates in structured, often repetitive, known environments. While the task is performed more or less without any human intervention, the system's input and responses are designed for and by an operator ahead of time, giving the system limited capabilities to handle unforeseen situations. 
The first distinction between the two concepts is that a fully autonomous system has the capability to handle unforeseen situations by performing problem solving operations without human intervention. And with that being said, automated functions are often embedded in autonomous systems. And some of you probably reacted to me using the term fully autonomous. Well observed. This brings us back to key point number one. We may describe autonomous as the extent to which a system can carry out its own processes and operations without external control. It is not a question of all or nothing. So let's look a little bit more into that. And for the purpose of this presentation, I will use the definition for levels of autonomy set forth by the Norwegian Forum for Autonomous Ships and CENTEF Ocean. The definition divides the levels of autonomy into five steps from decision support at the bottom to fully autonomous at the top. And while we can argue many alternative definitions with alternating focus areas, a common perception is that we have yet to agree on one internationally renowned definition covering both legal, operational, and technological aspects. So, when the news of Jade Bichlan were released in 2017, it was a bold story, I can tell you. A fertilizer producing it coming to a technology provider with a logistical problem in the form of a level four unmanned vessel. I can assure you, a lot of knowledge has been gained by all involved parties over the last three years. And one of the key elements in this process is the close collaboration between ship owner, operator, flag state, classification societies, and us as technology provider. With this in mind, in Kongsberg, we're also lucky to be working with operators on the lower levels of autonomy at the same time. Both driving the process for rules and regulations, as well as providing a softer implementation of automatic and autonomous functionality, such as, for example, for um, road ferries used by ourselves and some of our strongest competitors to test out autonomous navigational functionality. And even though in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, Yara has decided to pause the completion of Yara Birklan, the concept of this vessel has been instrumental in paving the way for autonomous ships, forcing the maritime industry to rethink its strategy. And it has certainly boosted Kongsberg priorities for developing solutions and services for a greener, safer, and more efficient maritime industry. And as we are on the topic of unmanned vessels, we group our development into what we have termed the three pillars of autonomous operations. The vessel's capabilities, and I'm not just talking about the navigational autonomy, we're talking about all the onboard systems. The bi-directional secure connectivity, including land-based infrastructure, and of course, the ability to use multiple carriers and having redundant systems. And at, at the end, the remote operation center. So even for a continuously unmanned vessel, there are humans in the loop, and they are now re relocated to a remote operation center, which can be either on land or on board another vessel. In our development efforts, our focus is on certifiable products and solutions commercially available. And with our background, we started with the existing vessel systems and sensors for understanding a vessel surroundings. We have grouped the vessel functionality into operate equipment, maneuver vessel, navigate vessel, manage mission, sense and analyze environment, and sense and analyze equipment, as you can see on the bottom level of the presentation. Moving on to the connectivity solution, we are developing and testing solutions for vessel to vessel communication vessel to shore communication and also for the land-based infrastructure. And for the third pillar, we focus on the fleet management, remote control, autonomous operation, ship management, and mission planning. And this is where it is really starting to get interesting. For example, looking at this from the perspective of statutory requirements. 
there are no rules in place today for unmanned ships. All the rules are written with onboard crew in mind. And we acknowledge that it will take years before we have a clear direction from the IMO, for example, the International Maritime Organization. And I would also like to highlight that even though these are the main functional building blocks, you can all imagine that there are several levels of details below this image, um, which we will be sharing at a later stage. And come talk to us and we'll explain more about this. But you may also notice on the top level here that I have separated between remote control and autonomous operation. This goes towards the level of human involvement and to which system level you are controlling. Are you directly sending commands to the rudder or propeller as you would in direct remote control? Or are you sending commands to the higher level systems, such as setting a new heading or future desired position, expecting the system to execute the onboard order by means of internal logic? And what information do you as operator in a remote operation center need to have control? That's the big question, isn't it? The transition of moving the operator from the vessel to shore with an identical bridge on land may seem the next logical step. But are you really increasing the safety of the operation? And what about the solution complexity? And what about the OPEX incentive, for example? You are certainly not reducing the CAPEX if this is a one-to-one -one swap. To add to the complexity of the discussion, you may have various level of control for different onboard systems, meaning that you may only require information from some systems while you need to send control commands to other systems. Additionally, what will be the safety case when someone in a remote operation center are assisting the onboard crew? The level of trust in the already well-proven marine systems and results from live demonstrators are key elements in this ongoing discussion between legislative bodies, crew representatives, us as technology providers, and many more. And there are no definite answers yet. But for us, this is where the benefits of our joint venture with Wilhelmsen really come to light in the company called Masterly. With Masterly working to take position as operator of autonomous vessels, we have strong partners bringing solid expertise and competence to the collab collaborative effort of transitioning autonomous vessels from concepts into full-scale sustainable solutions with commercial contracts. And as you can see on the screen, these are some of the steps and the modules we are considering on this road. There are many parties involved on this arena called autonomous vessels, and it is quite complex. So let us take one step back and look at this through an analogy. When you build a house, you have different professionals fulfilling their mission as part of the one uh, completion. It is exactly the same with autonomous vessel operations. You cannot look at this from a technical perspective alone. There are also the statutory requirements, obviously, the owner, the operator, insurance, the public, and many others. It is a close collaboration across interests and incentives. Applying the Haba Maba principle has also been a key element in our development process meaning understanding what humans are best at and what machines are best at. For us, we came into autonomous vessels with the intent to solve this by integrating the products and technology, technology modules already existing within the Kongsberg Group. This couldn't be too difficult, right? But some years into this, we appreciate the complexity of the task and are better at evaluating our strengths and weaknesses and to know where we need to team up and collaborate with partners. We are strengthened when it comes to working efficiently with complexity and focusing on the elements requiring effort, such as non-functional requirements. We understand that a stepwise approach to autonomous operations is the fastest way from a regulatory perspective, and that elements mandatory for an unmanned vessel may be just as applicable for a manned vessel to optimize performance or support onboard decision making. And with that being said, we still believe the rapid pace at which we are seeing changes in the maritime industry related to autonomy is heavily influenced by the first movers in this area. 
which are naval surveillance missions focusing on the safety of human lives, of course, and non-maritime companies looking to solve logistical challenges. So it's interesting to see those factors coming into the maritime industry and shaping it for the future. I would also like to say that we see autonomy as nothing new. The airline industry, for example, have been able to land planes without people in the cockpit for the last 20 years, but still there are people on board. Um, but it's the same, the technology is there. Uh, it's about humans taking it, embracing it, and utilizing it to its full capacity. We see this as not a revolution. It's a natural evolution made possible by technology and by the motivational incentives becoming strong enough. When we talk about autonomy, it is not just about the vessel. It is about the entire logistical chain. In Kongsberg, we see it as a means to transform the logistical infrastructure for global trade by making it safer, cleaner, and more efficient. And also, we see that we can combine what has been done for many years, working on subsea installations and AUVs with what's going on on the surface and bridging already known technology into a larger picture. And that was what I would like to talk about for this presentation, just giving you a short insight into um, the autonomous vessel concept and seeing this in a larger picture. And please remember, autonomous does not equal on demand. Thank you for your attention. We now open up for questions and we kindly ask you to use the Q&A function in the menu. So shoot. All right, so we have a question here about the Munin project. Um, it says, as far as I remember, they was first in this area. Do they continue their activity nowadays? And that's a really good question because this is one of the projects we have really taken inspiration from when we went first into our development uh, efforts. Because as we see, this is nothing new. We are utilizing known um, uh, information and experience from the past and seeing how we can actually bridge the new gap we have. Uh, and there are a lot of information which is still relevant, even though that project is some years old. So yes, definitely we are utilizing the things coming out of that project, putting that into our development process and also talking with the professionals who were involved with that project. Could you elaborate on the distinction between automation and autonomy? For example, autodocking autonomy or automation? Yes, of course. And that's kind of what I was related to when I was saying that we are working with operators on the lower levels of autonomy, meaning autodocking and autocrossing, for example, where we're utilizing the existing maneuvering and positioning systems. And uh, we have now been granted approval for using this system going um, fully automatic from key to key in Norway with passengers on board. And um, so we are testing this out and having real life data coming back. And we see that the crew is actually utilizing the system in 89% of the time. We had really good um, fuel consumption being lowered for every, every journey. And we have good results on that. And those are the first building blocks. The operator could intervene at any moment, uh, but we're adding on to that for um, utilizing the optical sensors, um, detecting objects, uh, classifying objects, and giving that information to the operator. And ultimately, this will also go into the autonomous navigational system with collision avoidance automatically incorporated into the system. So we see it as a set of building blocks kind of adding on to um, a system which can be maneuvered and operated fully um, without human support, even though the human can intervene either, either from on board or from on land. Is Kongsberg already in contact with the classification societies? Are they already setting up rules 
this is one of the really important aspects as we see that technology is not really slowing us down it's it's about coming to a maturity level for verifying the solutions in a way that we can put a stamp on it saying that it is safe and that is kind of the transition that we have been going through internally in Kongsberg with the first concept aiming to become um, an unmanned level for autonomous vessel and seeing that we really need to take it gradually because we need to acquire a level of trust in the system so that we can judge them to be safe. And that's why we need to take it stepwise. So yes, we are definitely in contact um, weekly, daily dialogue with classification societies and also other uh, bodies, legislative bodies. We are involved with um, some of the largest societies in, um, in Europe uh, and also in the US and in China. Um, we're also working a lot with the flag states. Uh, and right now we see that we are working on different national programs and also some of the European programs like the Horizon 2020. Um, and you could argue that uh, how, how long will it take before we can actually extend this to crossing the world oceans as we see we are working with demonstrator projects or commercial projects in smaller scale. But we do realize that we need to test it out gradually to build that level of trust so we can have it go all the way. Um, even though some would, of course, argue that it's a harder task to maneuver in congested waters than crossing the ocean. But then again, it comes to the connectivity and the price of that, which we are monitoring closely, looking at the satellite uh, incentives coming up and seeing that that will be some great opportunities in near future. Um, could you talk about the technology trend of Kongsberg Maritime, for example, ship intelligence? Definitely. What we do see, and that was even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit us, is uh, the focus toward having online services. And it's not about really the products anymore. It's about uh, looking at the performance and selling services and performance of time. So that is the shift that we see within the ship, uh, ship intelligence domain. It's not just about single systems, it's about the overall performance. And it is also about putting the vessel into a larger context as, for example, an integrated logistical chain where the vessel is just a part of that. So from our side, we see um, the technology and the need for that stretching more and more onto the key side and also the land side. Um, instead of just focusing on the vessel and its navigational purposes and the automation on board. Um, definitely we see a trend towards um, alternative fuels, uh, batteries, hydrogen, ammonia, etc. And also how about uh, combining technologies to making it emission free for longer distances. So those are some of the train trends and we see remote support especially in these days where travel restrictions are hard to, to pass. We see we need to have more online access and support online crew with the daily tasks and things going, coming up on board the vessel to optimize the performance and optimize the, the mission. Mm, so many questions. So I'm just going to pick out some. I'm really sorry about the ones I'm not able to to answer um, all of you guys, I will try to answer them later. Uh, oh, this is that's a good one. Could you please discuss any cybersecurity or cyber safety risks that these technology systems may pose? That is a major topic. And uh, just a few years back, I can say that um, looking in the mirror, we're really low on competency on this compared to what we see today. Um, we see a massive response towards the cybersecurity side and also not just about protecting the vessel from intrusion, it's about um, ensuring all the way through that the messages are not interfered with, that you really can rely on the information. Um, and we also see that the protocols and requirements in place are moving as developments are coming along. So there are existing rules and regulations, and of course we comply with that, but we also see a need to strengthen this as we go. 
And that's where I think that even though the maritime industry uh, sometimes is a slow mover in some areas and it's conservative, um, the need for data, the need to be able to look into data, to optimize the performance, um, to give commands from land, to, to have crew and experts in the loop being able to connect we see that need, so that will pose stronger restrictions also on the regulatory side and not just in the technology, um, technology solutions. But with that being said, I don't think anyone can guarantee to be 100% cyber secure um, competing with some of the, the large international forces working on this area. Uh, what are education providers doing to bring autonomous ship concepts closer to students as it looks like new skills and abilities will be needed in the future oh that's a really good question as well we are working a lot with the human machine interface experts psychologists and also um, maritime educational centers to look just at this because um, i mentioned it briefly that bringing the bridge from the ship onto shore might be kind of perceived to be the first step, but are you really in a position to make the decisions you need while you're sitting so far away? You have other tactical um, impulses and you are kind of losing out on something. Information might be arranged in different um, sectors that you are used to because all of the rules we have in place are designed to cater to onboard crew. And even if we are looking towards being able to be in control of or have the operational responsibility of more than one vessel at a time from a remote operating center, what does that mean for the human machine interface you have in front of you? How will you engage with the systems on board to maintain that operational responsibility? And um, that's what we are testing out on crew and operators today, especially utilizing uh, our company Masterly as a front end, because we have ideas and we know what the technology is capable of, but it's about not overloading the person sitting on shore. And it's also about not automating too many tasks. So you become fatigued just staring into a screen. So this is a balance. And in this area, we are looking into previous research done for military purposes where you, for example, remove the, um, the operator of, a, um, uh, of a, a tank, for example, from sitting exposed on the outside to inside the vehicle um, with a remote tower, actually. So there are applications already in place in other industries we are gaining experience from and learning from. So now we are running up on time, just one minute to go, I think. So uh, just the last question, who are your par major partners in these autonomous ship projects? Um, we are working with the several different um, operators and owners, especially in the European sector. Um, I do not have time to go into that right now, but uh, news will be coming out and just contact us for more information uh, on the development side i would really say that we appreciate the close collaboration we have with various flag states and classification societies because this is not an exercise we are able to undertake by ourselves thank you guys <laughs>